Well, the two big mills, and they turned out to be the two biggest pine mills in the world, both located here in 1916. And so there was this gradual migration from the upper Midwest to Bend just because of the jobs that were available here. Uh, the place for a small town really hummed. It wasn't a place, I don't think, to get rich, if you will, unless you owned the mills. Everybody was, in one way or another, close to the mill. We lived uh, eight blocks from it. But the comings and goings of all the employees that both of those mills required, it seemed vibrant to us with the trucks and the, it was railroad logging when I got here. Properly managed, the west side Douglas fir, you can get a commercial crop, if you will, in about 40 to 50 years maximum. Whereas on this side of the mountain, in its natural setting, Ponderosa pine doesn't grow like that. Once the timber was of a size that was not economical, the timber industry just was not going to be what it was before. But when you have two giant employers operating since 1916, the way they did, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, half of that is gone overnight, it opens your eyes to a lot of things. And it certainly did to Ben people at that time. You can get into recessions, but I, I've, I've seen it again in the 80s where People not only are not making as much money as they did, they're not here. They walk away from their homes. So even those people who have managed to stay and survive, it was very difficult. The town was so desperate for somebody to do something that they welcomed people from all over the place. We believed very strongly in Ben's potential. What we didn't always understand was how difficult it would be <laughs> before Bend realized that potential. The timber industry had gone through a horrible recession in, that peaked in 1982. This is 1987 when we come to town. They're still reeling from it. You know, half the storefronts in downtown Bend are boarded up. The one remaining sawmill in town was operating one shift. You know, Bend was in the process of converting itself into a really a recreational hub. Every one of our friends that we told that we were moving to Bend, Oregon, they had two questions. Where and why? So Gary Fitz is going to start a brew pub on Bond Street. Craziest thing that we'd ever heard of. Most of us old timers thought that guy has been drinking too much of his own stuff. There's no way that that can possibly succeed. Yeah, I mean, people held probably a lot of views of me and what we were trying to do and why we were trying to do it. And uh, sometimes you just have to prove it to people. Once we found the place we were looking for, everything fell together very, very rapidly. We were up and operating, not really knowing the kind of problems we were yet to face. I think the whole thing was a risk, you know. Hey, it's Bend, Oregon ready to support a brew pub, you know, and uh, he did not want to fail. It was his dream and he built it, but you've also got to take a step back and you have to know the story. And that's what this industry was built on. It was built on our stories. It was built on community. It's like the phoenix, you know. I'm from the very depths. All of a sudden, this thing emerges, and nobody could believe it. Or at least I couldn't, anyway. So I was 31 at the time. I was 31 when the, when the pub opened, and it was just me. Like all other kids, 
he was inquisitive, energetic, always looking to improve things, and he's kind of, kind of overbearing at times about, about being, being a perfectionist and getting things right. I grew up in California. I was actually born in Berkeley and grew up in the East Bay. Typical small town upbringing. My father managed agricultural properties. He was in the wine business back in the early 70s in the modern renaissance of California wine. We were in the evolution of wines going from jug wines to fine wines. My dad, his company eventually became you know, Robert Mondavi's largest contract grower. I mean, they grew for all the, the top producers in Napa and Sonoma, et cetera. There was a brewery in San Francisco, which uh, Fritz Maytag had taken over, and he was developing and did develop a very fine craft beer, and, and everybody raved about it, and I thought, you know, this kind of beer has to go where fine wine has gone and taken over. That certainly informed our approach to beer and the beer industry. Gary had been managing a restaurant and was a partner. I said, why don't we start a brew pub? I had basically hired myself out for free to a friend who was developing a brew pub just to be around and see what mistakes he made and become familiar with the beer business. Then our next question is, where are we gonna put this? I was traveling between Santa Barbara and the Oregon border, Lake Tahoe to the San Francisco Peninsula, looking for places to locate our brew pub and having absolutely no luck at all. My parents had come up to Oregon and they couldn't stop talking about what a neat place Bend was. We came up one weekend in September, talked to everybody we could think of, everybody we thought we would need to know if we were to develop something there, and we got the same answer over and over, which was, sounds great, I'll be your first customer. We took our business plans to three banks here, and they all turned us down. Banks didn't know much about breweries at the time. We talked to one banker here in town, and he said, well, we don't loan money to restaurants. He said, well, it's not just a restaurant, it's actually a brewery, too, that makes beer and all that kind of stuff. He said, well, we don't know anything about uh, breweries. Well, but it's a brewery, but it's, it's in a restaurant. Yeah, we don't loan money to restaurants. And we had this circular conversation for about 10 minutes, and we finally said, thanks, see you later. And then I told Gary, and I said, as far as I'm concerned, it's full speed ahead. Nobody could figure out why we were doing this. My wife was, okay, I'm with you, let's go. So we loaded up a U-Haul and put her car in, on a, a trailer hitch and in the back, and we were off to Oregon. And we, pulled in, didn't know anybody in town, and we started. What we saw as we looked, even though Bend was, was pretty depressed at the time, we saw potential. I was the mayor of Bend from 1997 to 1999. I thought it was a Great idea, but I didn't think it would fly. People had plenty of saloons to go to, they didn't need no fancy one. Because of how depressed it was, we could afford to buy a building as opposed to just lease one. Bothered some people because they saw, maybe this is a big change in town that we're not ready for. We moved right before Thanksgiving of the same year and the pub opened the following June. I was still trying to learn everything I could about beer and brewing, but really developing the restaurant, thinking I was gonna hire a brewer that could, could run the brewery. I put the ad in the local paper on Sunday to run all week. I had my stack of applications ready to go, boxes of pencils, you know, a couple of pump pots of coffee. I mean, I'm, I'm locked and loaded. I am ready to go. Go and unlock the front door at 8 a.m., went and had a seat, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., nobody showed up. By the end of the week, I had had a grand total of 15 applicants, of which I was pretty much forced to hire 12 of them. Uh, it was quite a colorful group of people kind of the 11th hour. I got a call from a person who saw our ad in the paper in Portland. I kind of was like the perfect 
person really with like two years of experience, which, which was, you know, that day a lot. I mean, the, this whole crazy movement really in Oregon and Washington didn't start till 84. I think the whole thing was a risk. I mean, Bend, Oregon, timber, a depressed economy. Tourism was not what it is at all today. We had a time that very first December where we got an infection in the brew house. It ended up dumping 10 straight batches of beer down the drain. Where's the problem? We don't know. Well, how can we find out? I don't know. We're utilizing every tool in our toolbox and it's not enough. John Harris and I had a lot of late night conversations about what the hell have I done? Yeah. At one point Gary said, you know, you're, you're talking about your job, I'm talking about my life. You know, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> we were down to one and a half taps. We couldn't make good beer. We were ever so close to going out of business days, maybe hours. Actually, we did figure out, we found a bunch of stuff that was just, was holding and trapping bacteria and uh, making our beer go um, sour. Of course, now we could sell it, right? <laughs> Sours are in. <laughs> we had already thrown the dice. We were all in and we weren't, we weren't leaving. And we got challenged on this a lot. I mean, we moved into a blue collar town that you know, was very much a Bud Light kind of place. And the closer our beer got to Bud Light, the more that fact was going to bear itself out. We needed to create something that was so different that it would make the consumer pay attention. He really wanted to bake the best beer we could. He wanted to make world-class beer. We went to the Great American Beer Festival, came back with three medals. That made Gary was pretty happy about that. <laughs> Mirapon took third to Sierra Nevada Pale and Anchor Liberty Ale. You know, I'm on the podium with fucking Anchor and Sierra Nevada. Does it get any better than that? No, it really doesn't, you know? Okay, we got, we got three beers to start. Let's go. The first beer we brewed was Cascade Gold Nail. The second one was Bachelor Bitter. Third one was Black Butte Porter. The first place we sold outside the brewery was I had gone to Mount Bachelor and convinced them to put us on tap for that upcoming ski season. The only reason I wanted an outside account was to get the attention of the tourists coming in town for Mount Bachelor. And maybe if they liked the beer, they'd stop by the brew pub on their way down the mountain. That was our, our complex market uh, attack plan for 1988. Having to shoots here did say, oh, there's a brew pub in town. Let's check it out. It became the go-to place, that's for sure. I was a Deschutes Monday night regular. It was just so fancy free. Like the gathering place and the feeling there was, was so cool. Everything we did ended at the pub. And so you would go in there after, you know, riding bikes or a day at the mountain and you just hang out and drink beer. You got people coming out at night and the camaraderie of the old pub feel. People were expanding their horizons. They were going, oh, I've never really had a good stout or a good porter. Before I moved to Oregon, I really had no concept of what craft beer was. <laughs> so moving out to Oregon, the first thing I drank was Deschutes. As soon as we got to town, we bought a case of, uh, what was it? Oh, it was Jubal, Jubal Ale. There were three guys at the bar with their ski boots on, and I go, what the? F I was drinking a Jubal, it was Jubal season, and within like, you know, five minutes, my cheeks were rosy, and uh, somebody made a comment, and I was just like, this is it, this is who I am. That was my introduction to what real beer tastes like. We got a call from a small boutique distributor in Portland. He said, look, we've got some of these tavern owners who've been through Bend on holiday, they've tried your beer, they love it. Can you send me a few kegs? Well, our decision to send Blackview Porter as our, as our flagship beer into the Portland market um, was, was key in Deschutes' launch. I mean, there was no other brewery making a beer like that. Bridgeport Ale was kind of dark, but it wasn't black. Our local distributor was the cardboard recycler for the region at that time. And we sent the first pallet of kegs uh, off to Portland on the back of a load of recycled cardboard. The next week, they ordered two pallets, and then four pallets, and then eight pallets. I knew it wasn't going to go away then. I mean, every, all the big guys at Blitz and stuff were like, oh, it's, it's just a flash in the pan, you know. I remember walking into Bridgeport at one point, and there's this guy from this, one of the distributors is in there, and looked at me, go, you guys are gone. You'll be gone in two years. You guys are nothing. It's like, right on. Say, so, thanks, Stu. Stu was wrong.
started getting letters from the city of Bend informing us that we were actually running an industrial operation in the downtown commercial business district and we're not allowed to do that. I mean, we were loading semis in the middle of the street. You've not lived until you've got a full load of kegs on front of the forklift down black ice through a, a slope with, you know, two rows of cars parked on either side. And uh, you, you, you really know you're alive at moments like that. You know, we were just trying to fill orders. Really, the demand outpaced the production. He came to me once and said, uh, you know, we've got an opportunity to really get serious about the beer business, and that's to build a production plant and package the beer. We began in the manufacturing and sale business. We were moving forward and we weren't going to go back. So I was promoted to brewmaster in 2011 and thrown into a project to expand, expand our cellar capacity. And to be, to be honest, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't prepared to do that, right? Um, for years, there was just so much capital investment in new equipment and building out the brewery to make more beer, because we're going from 120,000 barrels to close to 400,000. And then we started expanding into new markets and you know creating more beers. We'd have staff meetings, and there would be that excitement about, OK, we just launched California, or we just launched Colorado. Um, and company-wide, you felt that that excitement for sure. Um, and again, that sense of pride. Year over year over year, we have just seen this steady growth. There was a huge demand. We were staffing up and getting ready. We were running 24 hours, seven days a week. It always kind of felt like we're just keeping up and we need to add these tanks so we can make more beer. And, and you know, it's, it's just go, go, go. And um, we're no longer just providing beer to Bend, Oregon, you know, or to Oregon itself. I was on a cruise ship out of Istanbul, I don't know, 10 years ago, and I went down to the bar, and I looked up, and they had these various German beers and other beers lined up behind the bar, and there's a bottle of Mir Pond Ale and Black Butte Porter. So I'm at least 6,000 miles away from Bend, and here's this, <laughs> this brew from my own town. You know, kind of we built the stadium. Now let's make sure that we can fill it. And that's, that's what we're doing. It's an opportunity to make something and for, you know, millions of people out there, uh, which um, something that's pretty dear to me. Culture's funny. Um, it's an interesting dynamic right now, just in the industry in general. Um, 2018 saw 500 breweries open um, across the states, which is just insane. Um, you have now over 7,000 breweries across the US, um, over 300 alone here in the state of Oregon, um, which means that dynamics shifted. I think that you're starting to see the knowledge on the consumer side grow. We created that language. We you know, built that structure within which now the barriers to entry into the industry have essentially dropped to zero. Anybody can get in for, you know, fill out a form for a few bucks. You're a professional brewer with your homebrew kit in your garage. It's become exceptionally crowded and we have conditioned a consumer to value variety above all else. And, you know, local, Everybody wants to buy local, but local has become hyper-local. It's not local used to mean within 500 miles. Now, maybe it means within five blocks. Um, so it's a, very, it's a very interesting and challenging environment. And, and success is uh, a different thing than maybe a lot of us thought it would be. Shoots along with the rest of the craft beer world is fighting, fighting for consumers, fighting for shelf space, fighting for growth. It's not the, the Wild West, good old boy brewing world anymore. It's all about innovate or die. You know, it's sometimes hard to figure out where all the beer that can be produced in a facility like this is going to go. 
Our challenge now is how do we not only continue to innovate, how do we communicate in a way that they will understand and appreciate to the point of actually making purchases in the marketplace when we will never be new and we will never be small again. It felt very comfortable for a lot of years to be able to take the time and say, I'm going to learn about these traditional styles and then I'm going to brew them. And now it's like, explore every flavor, explore everything, and you're not like riffing off tradition, you're riffing off of 10 riffs from tradition. The one good thing with Gary and his team is they're innovative, they're creative. They are not afraid to step outside the box. That's how they're going to continue to grow. You know, it's just ever evolving. There's just a ton of innovation happening. And it's exciting, but it's also kind of hectic. We have everything we need to be successful. We're great craftsmen. But the world changes, and, and you gotta, you got to adapt with it. The brightest sun comes after the darkest night. Very proud of, uh, of what we've done, what they have done. Can you even see Bend without thinking of Deschutes? We're like ingrained here. I'm totally invested. I mean, I, <laughs> I am a little too invested at times. I, um, I have a lot, of, a lot of heart for this company. It's about community. It's about family. Deschutes has really helped to create that feeling, that energy here in Bend. I don't know that I've influenced or we've influenced Bend as much as Bend has influenced us. It's, it's a funny thing to say, but I, I, I believe it. It's, this has never been about me. This isn't a hobby. This is a real thing. This is something that means something to all of us. And, and uh, sometimes it's better to not know what you don't know.